What's going on YouTube today? We're going to talk about DFIR. We're going to uh, do an introduction to DFIR. So DFIR stands for Digital Forensic and Incident Response. Digital, D for digital, F forensic, I for incident, R for response. So let's start first by giving a definition for the DFIR. So as we said, DFIR stands for Digital Forensic and Incident Response. So how can we define DFIR given that Digital Forensic and Incident Response may appear to, may appear to be an overlapping, they are, appear to be overlapping, right? So, but in fact, they are not overlapping. They are, they complement each other. So Digital Forensic and Incident Response is the process of collecting first uh, the evidence on a compromised system so say for example i have here a windows machine okay now the ids intrusion detection system on my network alarmed me that there is um some sort of uh, traffic originating from this machine to a c2 server so this machine is communicating with um c2 server a C2 server, as you know, guys, is a command and control server set up by the attacker to send and receive commands from um, a compromised machine. So the IDS alert in my network has alarmed me that there is packets originating or being exchanged between Windows machine and a C2 server. How, how the IDS knows that this is C2 server? Well, over time, through threat intelligence, you will uh, study the attacker's profiles, um, harvest the information mentioned on the uh, threat intelligence frameworks, and you can add these IP addresses or indicators of compromise to your firewall or IDS. So by the IP address, your IDS has uh, made the judgment that Windows, your Windows machine is communicating with C2 server by the IP address of the C2 server. So what would you do in this case? You would start the process of digital forensic and instant response on this machine. So first you would collect the evidence on this machine that would indicate that there is a malicious activity on this machine. So after collecting the evidence and the artifacts about this hypothesis, Right, that the Windows machine is compromised and uh, we need to find out how it happened. You collect the evidence and the artifacts about that and then you supply the, all the information to the instant response team. This team will take, the will take the evidence, analyze the evidence and come up with a plan how to respond to that, to this attack. So by going through the instant response process. Oops, let me remove this one. Okay, so that's a, we ca that's a brief definition of digital forensic and instant response. So it doesn't only cover Windows machines, it covers all kinds of digital devices, computers, medical devices, smartphones, right? So that's the definition of DFIR in a brief manner. Now let's talk about the difference or let's compare digital forensics and incident response. So digital forensics handles the first stage, which is collecting the evidence. We want to collect here the evidence. Okay. So we received an alarm. Okay. From the IDS, we built a hypothesis uh, saying that this machine might be compromised through, say, an email attachment, right? Um, email attachment, drive by download, Trojan. Anyway, so we collect the evidence and then we feed the evidence to the instant response team they will analyze the evidence uh, an example of an evidence could be a memory dump of the machine right we take a memory dump using volatility framework for example and uh, we supply the memory dump to the instant response team and they will do the work of course you might be saying yeah so the job of digital forensics is only to collect evidence and then the instant response team will do the work of course not they actually complement each other so some people in digital forensics they would go and uh, involve get involved in the instant response process since some aspects of the instant response may require forensic skills 
such as digging deep into registry keys, digging deep into the logs, so on and so forth. So we collect the evidence, okay, about the hypothesis, and then we start the instant response process. Okay, now let's talk about main concepts in the digital forensic and incident response. The first thing is the artifacts. So artifacts are pieces of evidence. That's it. Some people like confuse the word artifacts. It's actually, they are pieces of evidence that prove your hypothesis. So my hypothesis here is that, for example, the Windows machine is communicating with the server, right? So there might be some uh, kind of maybe vulnerability exploitation because the windows is out of date or there might be um, uh, as i said earlier the user has opened an email attachment the email attachment contains um, a microsoft excel right excel uh, document the excel document contains a macro routine malicious macro routine so i build this hypothesis right depending on the uh, situation and then I collect the artifacts, pieces of evidence about this hypothesis. I would collect first the file, the uh, the malware. I would collect, uh, I would take first memory dump on the machine. And then if the time allows, I would also take an image of the disk. So I would collect the artifacts. Preservation of evidence. So the preservation of evidence is the process of making sure that the artifacts we collected, such as the memory dumps, the disk uh, clones, are not altered. How do we know that? We take a hash. It's very important to take a hash of the artifacts we collect. Sometimes we might take, like, the artifacts can be in the form of RAM, RAM, random access memory. So we want to make sure that every single piece of evidence we take, we make a hash of it. And making the hash is to ensure the integrity of the file. So preservation of evidence, we take a hash of the collected artifacts, and then we take a copy of the collected artifacts. We do not perform the analysis or the IR process on the collected artifacts. We make a copy, okay? And after making the copy, we also take a hash of the copy. Of the memory dump for example we compare the hashes we make sure that the evidence is not altered chain of custody a chain of custody in a simple uh, or prof professional or uh, like i'm gonna call it realistic uh, definition is the group of people or teams who are actually legally okay involved in the digital forensic process so chain of custody might be like for example first it starts with the team who collects the evidence and then it it may uh, goes next it may go next to the instant response team and it could also involve the legal team so we call this the chain of custody these people are allowed legally and from the perspective of the analysis to have access to what to the evidence which is the artifacts anyone who is outside this custody of chain is not allowed to gain access to the evidence because if they gain access they would break the chain of custody and hence they would raise the probability that the evidence might be altered order of volatility this sound may sound vague but it's very simple order of volatility is like the priority of the evidence collection the priority first goes to the ram the ram is the random access memory so basically the system memory changes if the system shuts down so what if during the collection of evidence the system shuts down for some reason if the system shuts down we will lose access to the memory system memory right the ram all the items in the ram this may involve the open files uh, this may involve the processes running the network connections all of these are considered as ram they are volatile memory they change depending on the system state so first we aim to collect the ram then we collect the non-volatile uh, objects such as the disk all files stored in the disk they are non-volatile so we aim first to make a clone dump of the memory and then we take clone of the disk timeline creation 
Timeline creation is very important as well in the digital forensic and instant response when we want to present the results to the stakeholders like the management we want to inform them how it happened from moment zero so we create a timeline of all the events starting with the evidence collection all the way through uh, the end of the instance response team and you have also to create a timeline for how the attack happened starting from the moment uh, the malicious file or the vulnerability uh, has been exploited on the machine all the way through till you eradicate the uh, malware from the system so I created all of these summarize all of this previously of course before that video maybe for so long in a document in my notes you can get access to the notes by subscribing to the channel membership so it start with the, as you can see the preparation Conducted the investigation and also notes about the kind of servers you are investigating if uh, for example if it could be endpoint machine and not a server and what would you do in this case what would you do if it was a public server all of this is outlined here and I'm going to update this as well with the notes of this video so now let's talk about the tools used in the digital forensic and instant response most popular tools let me let me call it the first thing is the Eric Zimmerman's tools we covered these tools in the past videos they mainly are focused on investigating windows so windows forensics you can call it now cape cape forensic we also covered this and there's also a note file attached to uh, this tool you can also find that note file in the google drive of course if you are subscribed um, cape is also a very important tool and popular in the digital forensic field the job of this tool is to collect the evidence it's like the shortcut escape but actually it stands for crawl okay artifact a for artifact p for parser and e for extractor it was developed mainly by eric zimmerman as well autopsy all of you know autopsy right i think most people even with um uh, let's say uh beginner knowledge about autopsy about digital forensics they know what the what's how autopsy works it's actually like used for analyzing the digital evidence you collect from uh, or by digital forensic volatility framework also popular mainly for memory forensics redline also covered redline previously it's developed by fireeye and used mainly for evidence collection and analysis now the last one that we haven't covered yet we will cover this later is the velociraptor Velociraptor is also a forensic tool, but used mainly for monitoring an endpoint. Okay, so we finished from the forensic side. Let's now talk about the instant response side. The side of the instant response. Now, there are steps to instant response, as you can see, and these steps are according to the SANS framework. Okay, now, NIST has also developed framework for responding to incidents so basically when you respond to an incident you go through steps so you either have to choose to go through the steps of incident response following the NIST guidelines or the SANS now these steps are according to SANS we will start with the steps and we will match them to the corresponding steps developed by or laid down by the NIST typically the NIST framework is uh, SP800 861 you can find us on the internet there is a document about this and at the same time there is a document about SANS instant response process okay so first we start with the preparation the preparation is a process you do it you go through it before the actual the breakout of the incident okay so the preparation includes preparing the resources, the tools, the machines, the team that are actually needed if the instant response breaks out. Okay. Now preparation in SANS is the same as preparation in IST. So they are both intersect in this. There is no changes. Okay. Here and here. Now the next one is the identification. So the identification is the process where you recognize that there is an incident okay 
um, there might be false positives in the network but once you detect that there is an incident you escalate it and then you, you go through the incident response process typical example would be you are going through the logs uh, in the in your seam solution such as Splunk such as um, Curator and then you find out that there is indicators of compromise such as communicating with a malicious IP a malicious hash in the network what's what so on so forth you escalate the incident and you start the IR process so here you have gone through the identification process this is in SANS but in NIST it corresponds to something called the detection and analysis that's the name of this step in or according to NIST all right the next one is containment so containment here let me reframe this okay in the containment what we do here after identify the incident we contain the incident it means the first step that we would do is typically shutting down not shutting down from the power no like isolating the machine from the internet cut the internet access here no internet the objective is to prevent C2 communications if any okay that's the, that's the objective of the step we contain the incident we prevent the malware or the Trojan from communicating with the C2 server so this is containment eradication eradication in the process of cleaning the machine okay it could be running an antivirus scan it could be doing uh, live forensic and removing the malware manually from all of the suspicious places recovery recovery is bringing the machine back to its original state if it was a public server we aim to like bring it back to operation if it was a windows machine or linux machine or endpoint machine we aim to bring it back to the user's latest working state so this is done typically by taking the latest clean backup before the incident happens that's the most guaranteed way now containment eradication and recovery they are all one step in an ist and the last one is lessons learned lessons learned we sit down with the team and the team lead in addition to the stakeholders we actually discuss the impacts of the how the of uh, sorry discuss the impacts of the incident on our network and we lay down the steps to avoid this incident in the future. Now, in NIST, this corresponds to, to post incident activity. Okay. So, guys, that was an introduction to the FIR. Now, let me take you to a small practical scenario in the room that's attached to this video. So, let's go to this and view the sites so here we are required to create timeline of incidents so basically our seam solution assume it is Splunk has noticed that there is malicious activity we have to piece together all of the events of this malicious activity by time by like ascending order okay using the timeline so first we have observed a malicious alert on our seam dashboard it seems like someone was downloading a malicious package click on the alert below to add it to your timeline spreadsheet so first you noticed that there is malicious activity on the network represented by a malicious package being downloaded so you add this is the first event source ip 150 trying to download cobalt strike from this ip the connection was blocked so what does this mean before I go on to this, it means that the machine that has the IP 192.168.150 is compromised. That's why it's trying to download the Cobalt Strike right from uh, this IP address. So I have, here you go, you got a machine that's compromised. Start the investigation. But first, add the timeline. The first event is witnessing the connection attempt. Okay, the next one. Since we identified an IP address in the alert, we filtered all the traffic related to that IP address in the same dashboard. So here, we actually they actually stepped immediately to the IR process. So in the same, we are analyzing the traffic from this IP address because we know that it's compromised, right? So we want to know what else has been uh, going on on this IP address. So we find the malicious IP address connected through an open SSH port in these filtered results 
So here you know, we're analyzing how the machine got compromised in the first place. We want to find what happened before. Click to add this result to our spreadsheet. Drag the events in the spreadsheet to bring them in ascending order. So, we, so the, 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 the first, um, or let me say the origin of this attempt was like there was an SSH connection, right, to the compromised machine. So we add this here, but we drag this before, as you can see. So here, the first incoming SSH connection from, as you can see, the malicious IP to the compromised machine IP address on port 22, the connection is allowed, was allowed. And here we find out that there are many failed attempts from that malicious IP to the compromised machine, and then followed by a successful attempt. So we add this here, and we drag it to the first, second line. So what happened up until now? As you can see from the same solution, we found out that SSH incoming connection from this IP to the endpoint machine was allowed and then followed by a successful login from the uh, malicious IP to the compromised machine right so here, this is how it happened it was an SSH brute force attack and then we check the syslog to find other interesting artifacts from the logs click on this and as you can see here the processed malicious file tried to connect to IP address so let's order these according to uh, how they happened first incoming SSH connection that's first after the connection was allowed uh, it was as you saw before uh, followed by many failed attempts and after the failed attempts we got one successful one so attacker now got SSH access to the machine maybe through brute force right and then we have to put this here I guess yeah and this is the flag so guys that was today's video. I hope you liked that and I will see you later.